Meet the U-Hawk, a new unmanned aerial system born out of a UH-60L Black Hawk helicopter that has removed the cockpit, replaced it with clamshell doors, and turned the flying over to robots. The combat-proven Black Hawk helicopter has been a staple of American military aviation for over 46 years. Introduced in 1979, it's been the go-to for troop transport, medevac, special operations insertions, and everything in between. But with drones dominating the battlefield, and a possible replacement identified in the V-280 Valor, its days appear to be numbered. Potentially saving the Black Hawk from the Boneyard is the S-70 UAS U-Hawk as it is officially known, but somebody in our Instagram comments is already calling it the Hawk Tua, which stands for the Transport Unmanned Advanced Helicopter. But no matter what you call it, it appears to be an important stepping stone to a future where human pilots may not be required to fly into danger as often. Welcome back to Task and Purpose, and thank you so much for joining me today. I am Kyle, and in this video, we are going to be digging into what the U-Hawk actually is, what it can do, what it could mean for logistics and combat operations, and why it might just be the future of rotary aviation, or at least our best idea of what that is going to look like. And yes, we are even going to wildly speculate on what different directions this could take. But before that, let's talk about something just as important, and that is, of course, shaving, especially if you're in the military. Like many systems fielded for our troops, razors sold at the exchanges and forced upon you in basic training are outdated and can rip your face apart, leaving you with razor burn and ingrown hairs, even though they're expensive, packed with blades, and backed by the razor industrial complex. Henson razors are different though. They're precise, built to tolerances of just 0.0002 inches, which provides more control of the blade. The razors are machined at an aerospace machine shop for exacting quality to help reduce blade chatter and keep your skin not just inspection smooth and irritation free, but also clean. Henson also donates razors to service members suffering from pseudofolliculitis barbae, aka razor bumps, and it works with them in clinical research trials to get them the best shave possible. Whether you're active, reserve, a recipient of a DD-214, or just want a good shave without spending a ton of money, head to hensonshaving.com slash task and purpose and use code task and purpose at checkout to get 100 free blades with your razor. That's code task and and purpose, just make sure that both the razor and the blades are in the cart. We want to thank Henson Shaving for sponsoring this episode. What the U-Hawk is in a technical sense is actually pretty simple, but in a more abstract sense, it is far more complicated. Put simply, the U-Hawk is a regular UH-60L Black Hawk that has had the cockpit removed and in its place is a clamshell door with the controls handed over to Sikorsky's Matrix Autonomous Flight Control System. Unlike earlier efforts to build optionally piloted helicopters like the OPV shown here, which retain cockpits and controls for human use, this thing is a true drone. There's no cockpit, no seats, no cyclic or collective. Humans have been completely replaced. Now, if we get in our feels, as the youth say, and complicate things, what this is is the beginning of the end for a lot of manned aviation. This has been a long time coming. In some way, I was at the beginning of the end when, in 2011, Fob Payne in southern Helmand, Afghanistan, was the first remote outpost to be supplied with the drone helicopter. I even have some illicit pictures that I took that day on my iPhone 4 because it was so goddamn long ago. Anyway, the K-Max delivered about 3,500 pounds of food and supplies to us at First LAR, which is the unit where I got this awesome axe from, and prior to that, they either had to send manned helicopters to get us stuff or send long convoys all the way from Camp Dwyer. Every single time that somebody brought something to us, they had to risk their lives to do it. These things, like the K-Max and now the U-Hawk, solve for that problem. Now let's get back to the real world where your feelings don't matter. 
At the heart of replacing humans is Sikorsky's autonomous flight software called Matrix. This has been in development for over a decade with DARPA chipping in considerably. Matrix is designed to give helicopters the ability to fly pre-programmed missions, avoid obstacles, land in unprepared zones, and reroute if conditions change. It is the heart of what DARPA calls ALIAS, or Air Crew Labor in Cockpit Automation System. It was ALIAS that piloted the Black Hawk OPV back in 2022 that really proved this technology out. This was originally meant to just help pilots, but now it seems to be replacing them completely. Sikorsky claims, and they've all but proven it with the U-Hawk, that with Matrix, even legacy helicopters can be turned into intelligent platforms that don't need human pilots in the loop. Real quick, a bit of a disclaimer, because sometimes when I'm writing the script or talking about it, I get excited. And when I get excited, I get accused by people in the comments of, as the U's say, glazing these companies or the technology. Sometimes it hits me how crazy some of this stuff is, and I always think back to like if you told 12 year old old Kyle about half of these things and told him that he'd be talking about it in front of a camera for the internet which barely existed back then. I don't know, 12 year old Kyle would do something that weird 12 year old kids that don't really show any emotion do. Anyways, this stuff is cool. I don't mean to, you know, glaze these companies or technology, but objectively, it's really interesting that a bunch of human beings have gotten together and designed and built these things that can do truly incredible things. All right, anyways, back to the important stuff. The specs on the U-Hawk that Sikorsky trotted out show a UAS that can do something that no other UAS can do today. Sikorsky boasts that it has 25% more room for stuff on the inside where it can haul 7,000 pounds of cargo or it can haul 9,000 pounds if it's slung underneath. The manned UH-60L with all the stuff for humans can only carry 2,640 pounds on the inside. Just to get an idea of what can be done with that increased cargo capacity, the U-Hawk can carry four joint modular intermodal containers like this one, where the UH-60 could only fit two. It can also deliver an entire pod of six HIMARS rockets or two naval strike missiles for the Marine Corps' Nemesis system. The company also says that the U-Hawk can loiter for up to 14 hours and can self-deploy up to 16 1,500 nautical miles. With the clamshell cargo doors, it accepts a wide variety of drive-on, drive-off cargo, including unmanned ground vehicles or UGVs. With that range, capacity, and autonomy, the U-Haul can do quite a bit more than just haul stuff around. One of the more appealing features is probably the Quiver launching system. Like Hawkeye's Magic Marvel Quiver, which he just presses a few buttons and his arrows get these fancy new warheads put on him, this setup is also modular that can be configured with a variety of what are being called launched effects. You can see the quiver shown here in a walk around done by TWZ at AUSA. Launched effects are things like loader munitions that are deployed from one thing to do a separate thing. Different launched effects are, naturally, blowing stuff up, but also electronic warfare like GPS spoofing, signal jamming, or localized microwave weapons. The launched effects could also be used to conduct intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, or ISR, or even designate targets with a laser. Launched effects are becoming a big deal because they give troops a lot of different tools in a small and relatively easy to deploy package. If you're still having trouble understanding what launched effects are, let's just go right back to Hawkeye's quiver, which all of his arrows are essentially launched effects, like the one he put into a computer and hacked it, or the taser ones. Those are launched effects just for a superhero. We've also talked a lot about the future of medicine on the battlefield because that is an issue that directly impacts service members. The U-Hawk has an obvious place in any discussion around future battlefield care. During GWAT, it was practically a guarantee that if you got hit, you would get medevaced relatively quickly, usually within about an hour. We had control of the skies and could really just do as we please so long as the weather cooperated. While observing Ukraine though, we are starting to realize that probably isn't going to be possible. In a future fight, especially in like the Indo-Pacific or Eastern Europe, we're going to see a lot of areas where traditional medevac is nearly impossible. Integrated air defense systems, electronic warfare, drone swarms, GPS jamming, a whole lot of other things are going to make and are already making it very dangerous to send manned helicopters to pick up wounded troops. Think of this scenario, a unit takes casualties on the edge of a contested zone that aircraft can't get to. 
Instead of calling in a crude Black Hawk, they dispatch a U-Hawk to fly to the nearest safe LZ. Once there, it deploys a UGV, which then begins moving to the casualty under its own control. Meanwhile, the U-Hawk loiters in the area, relaying real-time data back to higher headquarters, maybe deploying launch defects to intercept drones or jam signals in the immediate area. You get the idea. And this same concept applies to other missions as well. You could use this for special operations, insertions and extractions, contested resupply, picking up downed pilots, recovering sensitive equipment, and a lot more. Since a human isn't at the controls, you can get a little reckless and send these things out when things get really bad. This is all part of an effort to make our first contact with the enemy metal on metal, where a human, at least on our side, isn't put at as much risk. This echoes what Major General Brett Sylvia told Task and Purpose in 2024 when he was the commander of the 101st Airborne Division. As we transition to a mobile brigade combat team, we take out many of those manned platforms and make them unmanned platforms with new constructs. We're able to trade steel for blood. Or put another way, as General Patton elegantly said to the 6th Armored Division in 1944, no bastard ever won a war by dying for his country, he won it by making the other poor dumb bastard die for theirs. So let's jump a year ahead into the future and say that Sikorsky has proven that this concept works. The Matrix system is reliable, the flight control architecture is stable, and the U-Hawk performs well in field tests. Maybe the Pentagon even buys a few dozen. What comes next? The most obvious answer is a clean sheet design. Right now, the U-Hawk is constrained by the UH-60's legacy architecture. It wasn't designed to be autonomous. It carries a lot of weight and wiring, avionics, and armor meant to protect humans. A clean sheet design throws all that out. You could build an airframe optimized for autonomy. All those creature comforts like armor and seats are now pointless. It could be shaped for stealth, sized for shipboard operations, or built with lighter composite materials for greater endurance. The real value here is that Sikorsky's proving they can port autonomy into a proven platform. That's a huge deal. Most advanced drone programs get bogged down because they start from scratch. If Matrix can be scaled, then future rotorcraft can be built around software-first architectures. That's the kind of design philosophy that's driven programs like NGAD and the Navy's drone ship initiatives. Across the defense industry, it seems like we're starting to focus a lot less on the hardware and more on the software, and that's not necessarily a bad thing either. If the U-Hawk shows this model is viable, there's no reason that we couldn't convert other airframes. Take the Apache. It's one of the most advanced attack helicopters in the world. If you strip out the crew station, keep the radar, the sensors, and the weapons pylons, and then give it autonomous flight capability, you now have an autonomous tank killer that can also do counter UAS missions, close air support, everything an Apache does now, just without a pilot at the controls. If it works for the Apache, it could also work for the Marine Corps' Venom helicopters as well. These are battle-tested airframes. Converting them wouldn't really necessarily be easy, but it would be faster and cheaper than designing a new drone from scratch. And then think about the CH-53 that is also built by Sikorsky. Putting the Matrix software in a converted Sea Stallion, which is the new one, would create a UAS capable of carrying 36,000 pounds in a sling load configuration, or 30,000 pounds on the inside. These numbers could also increase with the removal of the cockpit and other stuff we don't need. You can do a whole lot of really cool stuff with 30,000 pounds of internal payload capacity. Who knows, maybe we start throwing the Rapid Dragon palletide munitions in the back of a Sea Stallion that's been outfitted with the Matrix and really start complicating things for our adversaries. There are also countless commercial and civilian applications where a system like this could be used. Think firefighting, resupplying offshore oil rigs, search and rescue, detailed land surveys, helisking, you just name it, anything that a helicopter currently does, they could theoretically do with this system. Regardless of how or even if the U-Hawk gets used, it could still serve as a bridge, a temporary stopgap between manned rotary aviation and the eventual arrival of autonomous purpose-built rotorcraft. And given how long traditional procurement takes, that bridge might be essential in maintaining the tactical edge. But it is not all sunshine and rainbows.
While the U-Hawk and other drones bring increased capabilities, they also bring increased complexity, and increased complexity is not usually something that you're looking for on the battlefield. Every time you remove a pilot from a cockpit, you're not just swapping them for software, you're introducing a whole new web of problems. Remote control links, autonomy algorithms, redundant communication systems, cyber vulnerabilities, and integration headaches with legacy platforms and command and control infrastructure. Structure. A conventional Black Hawk may need a pilot and a co-pilot, but the U-Hawk needs a full autonomy stack, which means resilient SATCOM links and a staff of operators trained to manage a system that nobody grew up flying. That is not an insignificant logistical or doctrinal lift. These types of systems are also a lot harder to troubleshoot on the fly. A human pilot can fly through a degraded situation using the best computer ever, the human brain where a human brain might realize, hey, it's not so bad, I can start doing this or that and actually make it through, the U-Hawk could just land itself because it got bad GPS data or lost the link. So while drones like the U-Hawk are promising and in some cases necessary, we always have to be a little wary about the next best thing. All that being said though, the U-Hawk is pretty exciting and not just for what it does by turning a UH-60 into a full-fledged drone, but for what this means for other aircraft and the service members who rely on them. Whether or not the Army or anybody else decides to field the U-Hawk at scale, this demonstrator is a turning point and the clearest sign yet that rotorcraft autonomy is here now. What do you all think? Is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? Is this just Sikorsky trying to inject more lifeblood into the Blackhawk? Is this something that we should be concerned about because Skynet is getting more capable day by day? Whatever you got, let us know in the comments. I wrote this script and Savvy edited the video and at the end of these videos, I'm gonna start taking this opportunity to talk to you because if you've watched to this point, you probably care a little bit about the channel or maybe you're just curious. So anyways, a few notes, getting notes on this. Well, first I'm Kyle, I took over the channel in April. I came from the Task and Purpose newsroom side where I was for four years. Prior to me coming over to this side, newsroom and, and uh, YouTube were kind of split. We're trying to bring that back in. But anyways, I'm Kyle, thanks. Uh, a lot of people ask about this ax. I got this from First Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion. Uh, I was with them from 2010 to 2013. Marines, that's the going away gift. It's it's sick, I love it. Then I got this Stinger missile. It's not really a missile, it's just a tube. I got that from 2nd Low Altitude Air Defense Battalion or 2nd LAD. Uh, they're great, I love them. Uh, more things about the no. I get a lot of comments about the, the lighting. I'm gonna be completely honest with you. I don't know what the hell I'm doing with lighting, the microphone, the camera. This is not what I'm good at. I don't know what I'm good at. So apologies for the lighting, for the audio. Sometimes I go too close. Sometimes I go too far away and I yell. I apologize for it. I'm really trying to polish that up. Please leave your comments about things I can improve uh, with my delivery, with stuff like that. I'm not really an animated guy. Don't really show a ton of emotion. Uh, not charismatic, as people might say, but I really want the information to be the star. Not me, I'm not good at the self-promotion thing. Uh, I'm not even really good at talking in front of a camera. So I want the information to be the star. Hopefully that's good. I think it's pretty good. We work very hard on all this stuff. So if it's not good, you can let us know. You're not gonna hurt our feelings. I don't have any feelings left. I was a Marine, I have three kids and a wife. You're not gonna hurt me. So. You can say what you need. I'm just really happy you're all here. Thank you for listening to me ramble at the end. I'll try to wrap these up sooner. Anyways, I'm Kyle, your friendly ginger producer man, who I guess I'm the host now. You are all dismissed, and I will see you next time.